Hi everyone, I have Lucy Lines from twolinesfertility.com.au who's gonna be joining us today to talk about embryology. She's basically the person that is there for you, ready to ask any question you ever had for an embryologist. At the end of the day, you're like, what question do I have about my embryos? She's your person. Think of her as the embryologist in your pocket, and I'm so excited to have her on today. She's created a really awesome program that basically improves the experience from a mindfulness standpoint for patients going through IVF. So I'm pretty stoked that she's, and I'm so excited to ask her about how she got into IVF and talk to her about all the things that she's doing and her predictions for the future when it comes to what's new. Hi, Lucy, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Amy, lovely to see you. So fun. So just tell me about yourself. Like what got you into embryology? Oh, look, it's a long story, um, but I, I started as a um, vet nurse, worked um, doing a lot of AI in cattle and sheep, did a postgraduate diploma in reproductive science and fell into embryology training after that. Wow, that's awesome. And you've been an embryologist all over the world, the UK, Australia, and what made you travel like that? Um, so the first one, I actually did a, an exchange, a student exchange when I first finished school to Sweden. So I speak fluent Swedish. And um, the first move was from Monash IVF in Melbourne to um, a clinic in Gothenburg in Sweden, which was sort of handed to me by a mentor of mine who said, you speak Swedish, don't you? I said, yeah. And she said, I've got a friend who needs an embryologist. It's all, pa all expenses paid, everything. You just go. <laughs> Okay, so I went to that. So that's how that kind of started that whole process. Yeah, and I was telling people how, you know, we kind of talk to you, talk about you like you're the embryologist in your pocket. And what does that actually mean? Well, I'm, I'm kind of available to people when they have questions about embryology. So whether you're lining up for an IVF cycle, you're in an IVF cycle, um, in a lot of clinics around the world now, you don't even get to meet the embryologist who's looking after your eggs and your sperm and your embryos and making decisions about um, how, you know, what's going to get transferred and stuff and, and what that all means. So you don't get a chance to talk to them about all that stuff. So um, I'm, I'm kind of it. I'm, I'm there. I'm there for that. And then you also have something that you're doing around the mindfulness that yeah. patients can um, learn or that can help them to support the emotional journey as an IVF patient. Talk to us about that. 100%. So 20 years ago, when IVF was all not for profit, in the clinics you went to, you had a whole lot of people loving and nurturing and, and helping you and supporting you through your IVF cycle. These days, IVF is very much for profit um, and processes are very much streamlined and, and it's easy to become disempowered and separated from what's going on and so what I've tried to do with the mindful IVF program is to on the one hand help people to bring up their general knowledge about what's going on with their fertility what's happening in their IVF cycle without all those late night google searches finding a whole lot of information that's not applicable to you so bring up all of that general knowledge around the science side of IVF and then combine that with a whole lot of information and, and guidance and support about how you can bring yourself back to homeostasis, how you can control some of those um, intrusive thoughts and deal with some of the, the emotional sides, all the emotional sides that go with IVF. So I've collaborated with um, a lovely girl called Tanya Mulcahy, who's a fertility hypnotherapist, and she has provided um, an anti-anxiety toolkit um, a uh, power of words program and it's all a combination of videos and audios download tracks that you can just have in your in your earbuds as you're parking your car before you go in for your appointment um, and then together with all of that we've got a beautiful group a community group where we can all get in and, and chat to each other really small group we, we capped it at 30 people and so it's just a lovely little group of people kind of like the mother's group you had before you're a mum. I love that. Oh, that's so fun. And to know that you're a part of that answering people's questions is I'm sure people really enjoy that. And yeah. I bet that the friendships are probably lifelong that people are making in that group. Yeah. And that's why I liken it to a mother's group. You know, when before I was a mum myself, I felt like there was this club that I really wanted to be in, but I just couldn't get in it. And, and this secret club. And, and this is kind of like your own little secret club of the people that you, you didn't really want to have to be in this club. But now that you're in it, why not join in with other people who are doing exactly the same thing as you at roughly the same time and hold each other's hands and, and support each other and, and make space for each other in that, that process. Yeah. I think most people know what an embryologist does. 
you know, especially people who are like listening to us right here. I mean, people who are following both of us, they know what an embryologist yeah. does. But can you take me through a day in the life of an embryologist? Like, what does that look like? Look, it, 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 it's different every day, which is the best part of being an embryologist because every day there's something different to do. Um, on, on any given day in an embryology lab, there'll be someone doing paperwork and preparation for tomorrow's egg collections, doing egg collections today, doing um, fertilisation checks from yesterday's egg collections, doing developmental checks on, on day two and day three for you know two or three days ago, thawing sperm, thawing embryos, freezing embryos. It's just constantly different stuff. And we get to follow patients all the way through their journey and, and hang on to those embryos all the way through. Um, as a real team, I, I often say to people, it's, it's the first and only time that I've ever really been involved in a single disciplinary team where everyone in the team can do the same jobs and we all swap around a bit and do different things all the time, but we really support each other in that, you know, it's just so different from a multidisciplinary team where different people have different skills and you come together. Mm. Is there any special music that's playing? Oh, in some labs, you know, the lab I worked in in Sweden, um, we had dimmed lighting and lovely music playing and it was really beautiful. Another lab I worked in, in, in I visited actually, I didn't ever work in that lab, but I visited a lab in Germany that was in a really old um, like a gothic building and it was up in the, the, the attic of this building and, and bare beams and windows open and I'm like, this is so different to anything else I'm used to. So embryology labs are different everywhere. Okay, very, very cool. That's really neat. Okay, so mm. I imagine you get a lot of questions about embryology stuff. I mean, that's what you do. So I'm just going to ask you a whole bunch of things. Number one, why do some embryos grow and some embryos don't? Well, um, that's nature. Um, that's where nature comes into it. When we collect eggs in an egg collection in an IVF cycle, we're collecting eggs from a cohort where in the natural system, only one of those eggs would have made it to ovulation. So it's natural to expect that some of them just aren't going to be up for the job. And embryos are so fragile. I mean, how do you handle them? I mean, you can't even see them with a the naked eye. You have to use a microscope. Like, how do you do that? So actually in the Mindful IVF program, I have um, a friend of mine at one of the companies here in Australia sent me some of the tools that are used in an embryology lab. And I show you some of those tools in the program so you can see how that happens. But it's, it's a lot of glass pipettes, a lot of really fine motor skills, um, fine motor movement, microscopes, hydraulic equipment to move the sperm injection pipettes on the ICSI rigs, lots and lots of training. Yeah. And then how do you keep track of each embryo? How do we keep track of them? So there's, there is actually a blog on my website all about how, how do I know these embryos are actually mine? Um, but generally, we do so many checks and balances all the way through to make sure that the embryo, the eggs that we collect from you and the sperm that we get from your partner or your donor um, are, are put together and the embryo that you get at the other end is yours. In some labs, they use RFID technology. Um, all labs will have dishes and, and tubes and everything labelled with names and numbers and colours and all sorts of different checks and balances to make sure that we, we keep track of your embryos all the way through. Yeah, I mean, I think of embryologists as like they're gemologists, you know, looking at <laughs> Markley diamonds and every embryo gets a rating. And how do you guys rate them? Um, look, yeah, yeah, we rate them on how they look. It's, it's all about how they look. Um, I, society tells us we're not allowed to judge people by how they look anymore, but that's kind of what we do in embryology. Um, okay. But we also add into that um, checks and balances as to what we have uh, particular time points that we expect them to have reached a particular developmental stage by that time point, and that gives us some information about their development. Um, and then obviously we can do genetic testing in some situations so we can biopsy the embryos and look at the chromosomes of the embryos and that can be really useful in other situations too. And what are some myths that you think need to be busted when it comes to embryology? Oh, look, it's the big one, Amy. It's, it's the, are you playing God? Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I get it all the time. I had it long before I even but was was a qualified embryologist um don't you feel like you're playing god don't you think that if people can't conceive maybe there's a reason for that and maybe they just shouldn't be able to and i say to those people no nah. 
Um, we can. I, would, I say maybe something that's not so nice. Probably not just no, but. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I might swear sometimes, but I wouldn't do that here. Um, <laughs> but I think that, you know, na nature still has a really big hand in whatever it is that we're doing. You know, we can collect a group of eggs and put them in exactly the same environment in the lab and get completely different results. And then we can transfer beautiful embryos to two different women and one will get pregnant and the other won't. You know, nature still has a very big hand in what we're doing. And um, I, I hate the, the distinction and we all use it. I use it. I'm guilty of it, of conceiving naturally or with IVF and it seems to be an either or kind of thing but nature's still very much involved in IVF we're, we're given these tools to help nature or to contribute or, or get a little guiding light or whatever but but we're not taking over absolutely not we aren't there's no such thing as like an embryo staple gun <laughs> it's no. all <laughs> right so how can people find you and before we're not done yet but before we get to people's questions, we have some live chatted questions about embryology stuff that I would love yep. for you. Do you have time to answer them for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, okay. yep. Before we do that, just tell us again your website. So I'm at twolinesfertility.com.au. Um, I, look, I'm not a website builder. I've done it myself. I'm an embryologist, not a website builder. So, you know, keep that in mind. But you will find all the information on my website. Best place to go is the Start Here button. And then under that button, that's up on the top. And under that button, you'll find all the different things that I do. Excellent. So now I'm going to go to some of these live chat questions. And if you guys who are joining us right now have any questions, this is the perfect time to add them. Okay. Here's, I think this is a question. I've done six retrievals with no embryos making it past day three. And I'm just mm -hmm. curious, is there anything we should be asking your doctor to add to the embryo process? We've tried Zymote, we've tried a protein wash, but nothing has changed. What, what kinds of things are you thinking about as an embryologist? Six retrievals, nothing has passed day three. So when embryos fall over on day three, if we're getting good eggs collected, we're getting good fertilization, we're getting good development to day three, but they stop at day three, I generally go back and look at the preparation pre-IVF. How did we prepare the eggs? How did we prepare the sperm? Um, and has that contributed? Because there's a possibility that the problem actually lies with DNA fragmentation in the sperm and it's worth going back maybe meeting with a nutritionist, meeting with a dietitian, um, and getting some lifestyle changes around. You could try doing the uh, My Toxins and Fertility um, e-course. It's a short course, it's only 47 minutes. Um, that might help you to overcome some of those pr preparation problems that will impact how the embryos develop. Well, I love that you didn't say it's because your eggs were terrible and there's no chance mm -hmm. Because <laughs> I think sometimes people come from a negative space. And I know that sometimes just the DNA isn't good and it's not in our control. But I love that you are teaching people about the prep and what you can do to prepare. I, I don't give up on anybody. So what makes a 4AA embryo? Sperm? Egg? Age? That's the question. Uh, 4AA is a grade of the blastocyst. So that's to do with what the blastocyst looks like. A blastocyst is a day five embryo. Um, so it should have um, still be within the original shell of the original egg um, and then have the trophectoderm cells around the outside, the inner cell mass in the middle. And we grade each of those bits and pieces to give us a number. Now, I will come back to if your embryo is good enough for transfer, it's good enough to make a baby. Your fertility clinic wants you to get pregnant. They're not going to bother transferring embryos that can't make a baby. So I don't focus on embryo grades at all. I think if your embryo is good enough for transfer, call it an A grade, sit with that for the two weeks while you're waiting for your um, blood test result and just focus on the fact that it was good enough for transfer, it's good enough to make a baby. Yeah, and embryos that are low quality can make gorgeous babies, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Just because it's an ugly embryo doesn't mean it's going to make a, a less than beautiful baby. <laughs> exactly. There's a child that actually her name on her birth certificate is 1% out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. so here's the next question. How does PGS testing correlate to the embryo quality? Um, so rather interestingly, it actually doesn't always. Um, so when we look at, uh, there was a, a, an internal study that I was involved in at one of the clinics I worked at where we, the embryologists graded embryos based on what they looked like. And then the geneticists did the biopsies on them. And then we correlated the, the, the birth information years later, or, you know, 
a year later when, once we knew how many live births there were. And there were, rather interestingly, a number of embryos that might have been discarded based on how they looked in the lab that turned out to be genetically normal um, and created pregnancies. So if we hadn't done the genetic testing on them, they might not be here. Um, so the genetics doesn't always correlate to how an embryo looks. What it looks like tells us nothing about who it is. It's like people you meet on the street. Just because they look pretty doesn't mean they're nice people. That's true. <laughs> and I, one of my amyisms, what I call them, your fertility isn't skin deep either. So just because you you know look amazing on the outside, it's just really important to kind yeah. of get things checked out. So, okay. So what have you seen help embryo quality? That's another question someone just asked. Look, it's all about preparation. It's it to, for for me for, for for where I sit and the information that I've gathered over my years of experience. It's all about preparing. You know, a lot of people go, "Oh well, I'm not trying naturally anymore. I give up. It's up to science now. I'm just going to do whatever I want." Um, but in reality, even when we do an egg collection, the, the three months before that egg collection are so important for the quality of the eggs that we collect. The three months before the sperm um, collection or, or however we get the sperm is really important for the quality of the sperm. And the quality of the sperm, the quality of the egg, they, they make quality embryos, which make babies. That, that's oh. the best thing you can do. So I'm gonna ask Lucy right now, you guys. The question for Lucy is, how often should a guy ejaculate before the egg retrieval for people who are not using a sperm donor from a sperm bank? Yeah, so um, period of abstinence should be around two to three days. Um, no more than three days, definitely no more than five days, and probably not less than one day. Um, so two to three days is, is a good middle ground. What about the lead up? I tell guys to ejaculate at least every three days leading up to the egg retrieval to have the best quality sperm on the day of the egg retrieval. Yeah, look, I would agree with that. I think that um, th this concept of abstaining so that we get the best ones, you know, let's hold it all in so that what we get is great. What that does is you end up with a whole lot of sperm sitting in the epididymis, um, eating each other, basically. And, and <laughs> you know, <laughs> sorry, sorry for that visual. No, you don't need to um, be sorry. But, you know, it, that's not a healthy environment for sperm. So absolutely, you're right. Every two or three days for a week or two prior to um, the, the egg collection and the day of, of, of all of the day zero, um, absolutely great idea. Great. And what's the training required to become an embryologist? Someone's asking that. Um, so it, it's on the job training. Um, you can do, I did a postgraduate diploma in reproductive science, which gave me a bit of information about the, um, the theory behind it all. Um, there is also a master's in clinical embryology that you can do. I, th I think there are a couple of those courses around the world now. There are various training places that do training for embryologists, but Based generally, really, it's only on the job. And there's a lot of scaffolding, a lot of support. Um, it takes about a year to train an embryologist. And the old embryologists in the industry will tell you that it's five years before they're really any good. Got it. Do you have time for more questions? Uh, yeah, I've got about another five minutes, I reckon. Maybe yeah. Okay, you got it. Is the egg or sperm responsible for a low fertilization rate? Can be either, can be both. Um, so it could be that the shell of the egg is too thick for the sperm to get through. It could be that the cells surrounding the egg just are not penetrable for the sperm. It could be that the sperm doesn't have the equipment right to get through to the egg. Um, it, could be that it could be either. Okay. Grading system, what's the difference between day three and day five? Uh, day three, we're looking purely at counting cells and how evenly shaped and shiny those cells are. Day five, we're looking at two distinct different cell types. We can't count them anymore. There's too many. So we're looking at what the formation of those cells looks like. Okay, next question. Can you use a Zymot chip and do ICSI at the same time? I don't know. I'm going to put my hand up and say I don't know what it's on. The answer is yes. And someone's asking the best follicle size, and it's just an overall picture of all the follicles, but I like to aim for follicles to be at least 18 millimeters. Someone's asking about HGH and priming. I base that decision based on your body size and um, length of time until your cycle start, typically anywhere from 10 to 25 units twice a week. Um, let's just see here. Let's see here. I'm going to just, I know you have to run off, but thank you, Lucy. Thank you for all. My absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you so much so for nice having me. On. Okay. And we'll have you on again and we'll do another live with Lucy. Okay. I'd love to do that. Talk. Okay. We'll have, we'll do it again.
Okay. Thanks. Have a good Let's one. Do it. Thanks again. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.